Thank you for joining us for this community lecture presented by Ridley Tree Cancer Center and the Cancer Foundation of Santa Barbara. I'm Dr. Juliet Penn. I'm a medical oncologist at Ridley Tree Cancer Center. And I'm Sarah Washburn, registered dietitian nutritionist and program manager at Ridley Tree Cancer Center. Our community lectures aim to inform and educate the public on topics related to cancer care and cancer prevention. Today, Sarah and I are going to discuss bone health the definitions of osteoporosis, some of its causes, as well as treatments, and how cancer and cancer treatments can impact bone density, and also steps we can take, both medicine and nutrition, that can help prevent bone loss. Most of us think that bones are static and no longer change once we're fully grown after childhood. But in fact, bones are constantly remodeling themselves. Old bits of bone tissue are broken down and new bone is laid down in response to stresses throughout our lives. In fact, I sometimes think about our skeleton like a medieval European cathedral. There is a lot of energy and as it is being built, but then it requires constant remodeling over the years as parts start to sink or sag or become dirty. And just like that cathedral, our bones are in a constant state of breakdown and buildup as well. On the next slide, we see two graphics of bone density throughout the normal human life, both for females, that's the pink line, and for males, average male, that's the blue line. You can see that between years zero and 10, 10 and 20, and even up to almost age 30, in those first three decades of life, bone density rapidly increases until we reach peak bone mass in young adulthood. There's then in both graphs for the male and the female, a period of stability where bone density remains approximately at its peak. And then you'll notice the graphs diverge somewhat. In the blue male graph, that bone density slowly starts to decline after age 50. In the female graph, however, you notice there's this sudden drop off around the same age between 50 and 60 before the slope of the line straightens out and essentially matches that of male bone density. That dip in the graph is generally related to female menopause when the ovaries are no longer making estrogen and the body's estrogen levels drop significantly. This correlates with a sudden drop off of bone density. But you see that for both men and women, it is absolutely normal for bone density to decline through the second half of our lives. This means that essentially it is normal for a 90 year old to have half the bone density of a 40 year old. The reason that this, this graph looks the way it does, that there's a rapid increase in bone density early in life, stability, and then drop off, has to do with our bone physiology and how bone is made and broken down. There are two types of specialized cells that help this remodeling process. There are osteoclasts, and you can see in this microscopic picture of bone in our third slide, those large cells at the front of that what looks like an army moving through an empty space in bone, those large purple cells are osteoclasts. Those dissolve old bone, making the way for the osteoblasts, which are coming in behind them, to build up new layers of bone. Now this occurs in part in response to stressors. If you were to, let's say, suddenly take up weightlifting or tennis, our osteoclasts and osteoblasts would immediately go to work to remodel your bones in a better, as a better fit, a better match for your new activity. But they also exist in balance. The osteoclasts break down bones more equal to or less quickly as than the osteoblasts can build them up. And if you remember the graphic where the, in early life, there's a rapid increase in bone density, the osteoblasts are able to work much more quickly than the osteoblasts leading to increased new bone. In the midlife where bone density is stable, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts are approximately in balance in terms of breaking down and building. And then through the second half of our life, for reasons that are not entirely clear, osteoclasts are able to work faster than the osteoblasts. And so we lose bone density with time. Because of this imbalance, over time, our bones can become brittle or porous. And you can see this can lead to the development of osteoporosis if it's significant enough. In this picture, we see two uh, bones, two vertebral bones, bones of the spinal column. The one on the left shows essentially normal bone density where the struts or strands, they're called trabeculae, of bone are adequate to 
maintain the strength, the hardness of that bone. In osteoporosis, however, because there has been so much breakdown, the bones are essentially porous and weak and can easily collapse. Osteoporosis for most of its course is an asymptomatic condition, meaning we don't feel that loss of bone density. Some people confuse or conflate the concepts of osteoarthritis, the term osteo is in it, just meaning bone, and that's the joint pain many of us feel in our middle and later life due to wear and tear, with osteoporosis, which is causes no pain and essentially has no symptoms. So we do not know when our bones are thinning until the thinning is such that it leads to fractures with minimal trauma. Now, anyone can have a fracture if they have a major trauma, a, a large fall or an accident that can lead to a bone fracture, even in the hardest, densest bones. But in osteoporosis, we can develop fractures with minimal to no trauma, such things as falling while walking in your garden or sitting down too hard on a chair can cause the spinal bones to fracture, just like in that picture. Those osteoporotic fractures, what we call insufficiency fractures, are often the first sign that a person's having bone thinning. So the question comes up then, how should we look for osteoporosis and whom should we test? Well, risk factors for earlier onset or more severe osteoporosis include a low adult body weight. Um, for women, a, bo a, a adult body weight, average adult body weight below 127 pounds for most of our life increases the risk of osteoporosis. Long-term cigarette smoking increases osteoporosis risk. Chronic malnutrition, including uh, poor nutrition or calorie restriction in childhood or young adulthood can increase the risk of osteoporosis and a family history of early osteoporosis. So if someone has a mother or a grandmother who developed a, a bent spine or a hip fracture with minimal trauma, that can suggest that oneself is at risk for early osteoporosis. Now, medical conditions can also increase this risk autoimmune disorders that require long-term steroid use. The steroids will cause bone thinning um, and cancer therapies. So any therapy that lowers estrogen or testosterone levels will um, cause that sudden drop that we saw in the earlier graph, similar to menopause, that can lead to development of thinner bones over time. These medicines are often used for breast cancer therapies when we're trying to lower estrogen levels to avoid recurrence of breast cancer, or prostate cancer therapies for men lower testosterone levels and thus also lower estrogen levels in men as well. This leads to a lot of the side effects of these drugs, including early osteoporosis. So these patients that we think might be at risk, either because of their medical history, their medication use, or their family history, we would consider treating, excuse me, testing and treating for osteoporosis. So how do we measure bone density? Well, the most common mechanism of measuring bone density is with a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. That's a DEXA scan. A DEXA scan, and you can see a picture of a DEXA scanner on the slide, is nothing more than an X-ray. An, an X-ray that is able to take a picture of and then quantify the density of bone in certain key areas. These typically include the hip, the spine, and in some patients also the forearm. These are the areas that are uh, most likely to uh, develop an insufficiency fracture with minimal trauma if osteoporosis is present. The benefits of a DEXA are that it is very precise. We can we can precisely quantify um, the bone density in those areas. It also uh, confers very little radiation. The radiation that a person receives during a DEXA scan is approximately equivalent to what one would get walking around from the ambient solar radiation for one day of our life. So it's a really minimal amount. Other ways of measuring bone density can include CT scans and ultrasounds. These are not preferred. CT scans tend to be more expensive and uh, expose patients to a lot more radiation than a DEXA scan. And ultrasounds just aren't as precise. For my patients, I'll generally repeat the DEXA scan every two years because that's an interval of time that we can see uh, the development or the um, progression of any bone loss. So we've gotten our DEXA scan. Now the question is, how do we interpret it? What does it mean? 
Well, bone density determinations are all made relative to a young adult normal. Basically, we're all compared to the average 25 year old. Unfair perhaps, but this is how it's done. So your measurement or score on your DEXA scan will be a number between positive and negative that relates to the standard deviations or how far above and below a young adult normal one's bone density may be. So between negative one and positive one is considered normal bone density. Between negative one and minus 2.4 is osteopenia or decreased bone density. And between negative 2.5 and below is osteoporosis. Now these seem like clear cutoffs, but in fact, this is, a, this is a spectrum. The higher your bone density within any range, the lower your risk of fracture. The lower the bone density within any of these ranges, the more likely one is to develop a fracture. The next thing I wanna talk about is how cancer therapies specifically affect bone density. There is a class of cancer therapy often used for cancers like breast and prostate cancer, but also others that alter one's hormone levels. This class we term endocrine therapy. Endocrine therapy is any cancer treatment that alters either the hormone levels or the receptors. Um, in susceptible people, lowering estrogen or testosterone levels can lead to earlier or more significant bone loss and premature osteoporosis. So if you take a look at this graphic, you'll notice it's similar to the graphic I showed earlier, which had the lifetime male and female bone densities. This graph, however, looks at female bone density only. And you can, and, in, and then shows how different factors in one's life can affect that density. So you can see that rapid increase in, in young life, the stable period in adulthood, and then the decrease over time. But here, the lower line shows what can happen if someone has suboptimal nutrition or health habits in their youth. And you, um, that person will then never reach their optimal bone density level. They're starting from a lower, start, lower peak bone mass in adulthood. And so they develop osteoporosis that is moving into the dark pink region much early in, earlier in their life, putting them at risk for fractures. We can also see how either early menopause, often induced by cancer therapies, or sudden rapid loss, often induced by our endocrine therapies or hormone therapies, can push someone from that higher line onto a lower slope and again, put them at risk for earlier osteoporosis. So what do we do? Let's say we have a patient, we've measured their DEXA and either because of cancer therapies or for other reasons, they've developed early osteoporosis. Well, there are several medicines that can help uh, either minimize bone loss or uh, increase the gain of bone density. Now, every treatment, every medicine out there has specific risks and benefits, but some of the medicines we use include bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are commonly used um, bone hardeners in both pill and injection form that slow down the breakdown and removal of bone. Actually, they slow down the work of those osteoclasts, those cells that break down the bone and allow the osteoblasts to catch up. These include alendronate, resendronate, zolendronic acid. Um, estrogen receptor modifiers are another class of medicines. So these are medicines like tamoxifen or raloxifene that many people have heard of. And these medicines stimulate estrogen receptors on the bone, thus allowing the bone to build itself up more. Incidentally, these medicines are also often used to treat breast cancer. So in patients who are at risk for bone loss, they're often a good choice. Denosumab is an antibody directed against a protein that's involved in the breakdown of bone and thus minimizes that bone breakdown as well. Finally, anabolic agents are only used in very severe osteoporosis and for short periods. These include parathyroid hormone injections and antibody medicines that can rapidly improve bone density to minimize risk in patients who are really at very high risk of sudden or spontaneous fractures. Like I said, all of these medicines have their benefits, but they also have significant risks. And you can imagine looking at the graph, really the best way to avoid osteoporosis is to prevent it in the first place by maximizing our peak bone density in life and then slowing the decline as much as possible. And for this, diet and exercise really are our best options. 
And I will pass things over to Sarah Washburn now to discuss the role of nutrition in bone health. Thank you, Dr. Penn, for all that wonderful information. Now we're gonna talk about some nutrients that are important for bone health. We're gonna focus on the first four in this list, calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and vitamin K, because these are the four nutrients that have been studied the most related to bone health. I think of this list as very long list that really isn't complete. Like um, these nutrients are somewhat like instruments in an orchestra. The synergy and the way these nutrients work together to produce optimal bone health is, is like a piece of music. It's vibrant and it's balanced. So what does that look like on a plate? It's eating whole foods. It's fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, quality meats, herbs and spices, all of these play a role in your bone health. So let's talk about these individual nutrients. Calcium, it's the most abundant mineral in the body and the principal mineral that makes bones strong. 95 to 99% of the bones total calcium content is in the bones. Calcium metabolism is complex. If you don't consume enough calcium from foods, your body will take the calcium that it needs from your bones and put it into your bloodstream. So let's talk about calcium in the blood. There is a level, a range of calcium in the blood that's normal, but your blood calcium can be low or high. Hypocalcemia is low calcium in the blood. And some medications can abruptly lower calcium in the blood. Dr. Penn talked about some of those medications today. Your oncologist may prescribe you a calcium supplement in this situation. Hypercalcemia, which is high calcium in the blood, may be related to actually your cancer metabolism. Your oncologist may give you medication, it may be IV or intravenous, to help lower the calcium in your blood. The requirements for calcium for adults are as follows. Men and women between the ages of 19 and 50 and men between the ages of 51 and 70 need 1,000 milligrams a day. Women between the ages of 51 and 70 and men and women greater than 70 years old need 1,200 milligrams a day. And men and women with osteoporosis need 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams per day. Calcium sources in foods vary. There's yogurt and plant milks that are fortified with calcium or sardines with the bones because the bones contain some of the calcium. Milk, tofu that's fortified with calcium. Almonds, kale, chia seeds, pinto beans, broccoli. All of these are sources of calcium and you can see the ranges of milligrams per serving size. So if you were to get up in the morning and have six ounces of yogurt with some almonds and chia seeds, you could consume about 350 milligrams of calcium in your first meal of the day. Note that there are references or sources at the bottom of each of these pages. If you prefer to go look for other sources of calcium, these are great references. If you don't wanna eat dairy products or you don't wanna eat meat or animal products, and you prefer a vegan meal, you can still meet your calcium requirements. Almond milk with berries and chia seeds and ground flax seeds for breakfast, for lunch having hummus and bread and sliced tomatoes and cucumbers and almonds, and dinner some black beans with brown rice and broccoli with a large salad and some vinaigrette dressing, you've got a thousand milligrams of calcium. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is necessary for bone growth and repair. It allows calcium to be absorbed into the intestines and into the bones. Vitamin D deficiency increases fracture risk. Our bodies produce vitamin D from sunlight. So what we need to do is expose our arms and legs to the sunshine for about 15 minutes between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. several days a week to produce vitamin D right on our skin in our body. Sunblock can block the production of vitamin D. 
by about 95%. Some cancers can increase the skin sensitivity to sunlight, so patients may be advised to protect their skin and stay out of the sunlight, potentially lowering their vitamin D production. Older people and people with dark skin are less able to produce vitamin D from sunlight. We can consume vitamin D from food as well. Daily requirements are somewhere between 600 and 800 units, depending on your age. Food sources of vitamin D are somewhat sparse, and so many people require supplementation. Here's a list of food sources. Cod liver oil is a very good source. However, relying on that every day may put you at risk for excessive vitamin A intake, and vitamin A in excess can lead to decreased bone density. Salmon's a good choice, mushrooms, cow's milk, plant milk such as soy, almond, and oats milks, sardines, eggs, and tuna. Magnesium. 60% of the body's magnesium content is in the bones. It helps to optimize calcium and vitamin D metabolism. Serum magnesium level in the blood do not necessarily, necessarily reflect the total body magnesium. Daily requirements are somewhere between 300 and 400 milligrams. Studies show that 50% of Americans do not meet daily requirements for magnesium. Whole foods have the greatest amount of magnesium. Refined and processed foods are not good sources of magnesium. Magnesium sources in foods, pumpkin seeds, almonds, peanuts, oats, black beans, edamames, butternut squash, tomatoes, avocados. So if you had a meal of black beans with, it, with some tomatoes, pureed tomatoes, and some roasted butternut squash with avocados on top, you'd be getting about 300 or so milligrams of magnesium a day. Vitamin K helps preserve bone health by supporting one of the main proteins in bone called osteocalcin. Vitamin K deficiency is associated with bone fractures, although vitamin K deficiency is quite rare. Adequate intake is 90 micrograms per day for women and 120 micrograms per day for men. There are two forms, philoquinol, which is K1, that's the main dietary source, and there's menaquinol, which is K2, and that comes in a couple of different forms. Most studies look at MK4 and MK7, and vitamin K can be produced by bacteria in the GI tract. Here are some sources of vitamin K, NATO, which is a fermented soybean product in Japan, got a lot of vitamin K, spinach, broccoli, soybeans, pumpkin, blueberries, chicken, vegetable oils, eggs, and mixed nuts. So now we're going to talk about the dietary supplements associated with those four nutrients. But before we start, I'd like to just make a couple of comments about dietary supplements. They are intended to correct nutritional deficiencies. They're used to meet necessary amounts of certain nutrients and because people are individuals and we practice personalized medicine, your, in, your nutrient requirements for a specific nutrient may be different than somebody else's. What you want to do is complement your diet with your supplement. So your food sources plus your supplement equal the necessary amount that you need for you as a unique individual. Remember to tell your oncologist and your oncology nutritionist about your supplements because many um, of these may interact adversely with your medications, your treatments, and other supplements. And higher doses of supplements are not necessarily better. So let's talk about calcium supplements. Calcium supplements plus vitamin D reduce fracture risk in middle age and older adults. This study demonstrates that the combination of calcium and vitamin D have the unique property of reducing fractures, not each individual supplement by itself. Popular doses of calcium include calcium carbonate, which is 40% elemental calcium, meaning it has 40% calcium and 60% carbonate. 
It's inexpensive. It must be taken with food. It needs stomach acid for absorption. It may not be well absorbed if you take medications that reduce stomach acids, such as proton pump inhibitors. Another common form is calcium citrate, which is 25% elemental calcium, meaning it has 25% calcium and 75% citrate. You can take it anytime. It's better absorbed and more bioavailable than calcium permanganate. Let's talk about how to choose a supplement in a grocery store and things to look for. The first label on the left shows the front label of a bottle that is calcium, a chewable calcium, and it has 500 milligrams. The back label represented by the center label is indicating that's calcium carbonate and it's 500 milligrams as it says on the front of the label. It also says that it provides 38% of the daily value for calcium. The daily value for calcium, the reference amount is 1,000 milligrams. So 38% of 1,000 is 380. So anytime you're looking at a label and you see the percent of daily value for calcium, just talking about calcium, you can add a zero to that 38% to get the actual amount in milligrams of calcium that you're getting from that pill, from that serving size. Now the last label on the right-hand side is a calcium citrate product. You can see that from the ingredient list and it says calcium elemental. This is a bottle that is showing you actually how much elemental calcium, calcium is in the product, which is 400 milligrams, which is 40% of the daily value. Again, if you add a zero, you've got your 400 milligrams of elemental calcium in that product. Do note the serving size on that last label. It's two caplets. Make sure you look at serving sizes to get a feeling of how many pills you want to take or need to take if you buy that product. And just remember, take no more than 500 milligrams of calcium at one time. You only absorb about 500 milligrams at once, and the rest will go out in your stool if you take a lot more of that at one time. Calcium supplements and heart disease. In 2021, there was a meta-analysis of 13 randomized double-blinded clinical trials that concluded that excessive calcium supplementation was associated with cardiovascular disease. Too much calcium is not a good thing for a variety of reasons, including your heart, as well as the potential risk for kidney stones and other problems. Most people who need calcium supplements due to inadequate dietary intake of calcium need no more than 500 milligrams of calcium per day because they're getting the rest of it through their food choices. Vitamin D supplements. What's great about vitamin D is that we have a reliable marker to assess vitamin D status in the body. It's called a 25 OH vitamin D level that you can check in the blood to assess the adequacy of your exposure to the sunshine and your intake of vitamin D. Low levels are common in cancer patients. Low levels also can lead to abnormal cell division and have been associated with joint and muscle pain, fatigue and compromised immunity, just to name a few conditions that are associated with low vitamin D levels. Vitamin D supplements, there are two major sources, ergocalciferol, which is D2, that's made from plants and fungi, and cholecalciferol, which is D3, it's made from animals. So if you prefer not to have animal products, you're a vegan, you may prefer to buy a D2 product. The Endocrine Society recommendations to correct vitamin D deficiency, which is defined as a 25 OH vitamin D level of less than 22 nanograms per milliliter, is to take 6,000 units of vitamin D a day or to take 50,000 units once a week for eight to 12 weeks. And this is either taking vitamin D or two or D3. Remember, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So you wanna take it with a meal that contains fat. Magnesium supplements. 
there's no clear evidence that magnesium supplements reduce fracture risk. Um, it can be used to correct magnesium deficiency and supplement diet if there's inadequate magnesium in the diet. Magnesium is found in many multivitamins, and there are many forms of magnesium if you choose to take a magnesium supplement. I think there are 10 or 15 different forms. Magnesium oxide and sulfate tend to be more laxative in nature and may not be absorbed as well. Magnesium chloride, glycinate, glycerophosphate are better absorbed and tolerated, especially with somebody that has a sensitive GI tract. And less tolerated in higher doses are mag magnesium citrate, gluconate, lactate, and aspartate. Vitamin K supplementation. There's no clear evidence that vitamin K supplementation reduces fracture risk. Um, it can be used as magnesium can to correct a known deficiency and to supplement the diet if there's inadequate vitamin K in the diet. It is in some multivitamins, but not all of them. And as we discussed earlier, there are two forms, K1 and K2. MK7, which is a form of K2, is more expensive and has been shown to increase vitamin K levels in the blood at lower doses than the K1. Finally, don't forget about physical activity. Weight-bearing exercises such as these are super important for your bones. Note that swimming and bicycling are not on this list as they are not defined as weight-bearing exercises. In summary, osteoporosis is an asymptomatic condition that can lead to bone fractures. Bone health can be compromised by lifestyle choices, med medical conditions, medications, and cancer treatments. Many nutrients contribute to bone health. So eat a whole foods diet to get all those nutrients. Supplements are usually not needed with some exceptions. For people who usually consume foods low in many nutrients, correcting a single vitamin deficiency really may not be enough to prevent fractures. And finally, exercise movement help protect your bones. Thank you so much for joining us for this community lecture. We hope this information has been helpful. As a reminder, everyone's health situation is unique. If you have any questions or concerns regarding your health, please contact your healthcare team.